Stopping the paradise of white collar crime. Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of people. Well, John, we're here finally. Hi, mate. How are you going? Yeah, good. Um, it's been a couple of weeks since we uh, si- since you put up a very provocative <laughs> post, uh, but I'm happy to say to the audience uh, we had a lot of questions about your uh, um, your, your your cryptic message. But uh, all I can say is is that we're still on good speaking terms. Absolutely, and I should say just for anybody who watched that previous show. John wrote the script, right? So there was no intent on my behalf to <laughs> undermine him or anything. It was all John's work. I just voiced them for him. Fair enough. Um, I mean, there were some people who knew that it was my handiwork, but there was other people who uh, thought you literally threw me under the bus. Yeah, yeah, I got a few people pretty abusive, frankly. But never mind. We are hanging in there. And look, this is a really important conversation because it really does cut to the heart of how investors are or are not protected in Australia? And that's a big question. Yes, absolutely. So, Martin, since we've been broadcasting since 2018, we've done a whole host of very interesting topics, um, mainly related around the economy, uh, also related around um, politics as well. Um, uh, Part of the reason why I thought it would be interesting for you to do that last post and talking about my secret journey is is to give people a bit of an insight that we're going to cover a few like we're going to cover this topic of financial crime um uh, because because th- there has been some big things happening with me around financial crime over the last 12 months that we're going to uh, talk about in the next few episodes but 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 it is a big topic it's something that we haven't focused a lot of time on over the last four years but uh, it, it, when we when when people think about um, uh, in terms of the economy, in terms of generating wealth, in terms of protecting their legal risks. Uh, and obviously, when it comes to bail-in, we were talking about a type of risk to uh, depositors and why that was important. And so now we're going to broaden the conversation about legal risk around uh, around investments and really focus on this issue of financial crime because it is a big topic. Now, in 2014... The chairman of ASIC, so the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, Greg Medcraft, went on the public record and said Australia is a paradise for white collar crime, and that caused a huge uh, wave of media articles um, to the point that the government actually had to pull him aside and say, you know, you need to tone down these comments because that's not the international image that we want to give. And obviously, uh, around the world, there is a perception that Australia is relatively clean country when it comes to financial crime and that there are other jurisdictions that are that have problems but we do have some significant problems in this country uh and, and and we have some significant issues with the regulator in relation to financial crime and there's been a number of uh reviews into asic uh, whether it's the 2014 um uh senate economics references committee inquiry into asic's performance or the royal commission or last year there was an inquiry into the collapse of the sterling income trust that uh left uh, more than 100 retirees who uh that who had lost their savings and and so 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 the, you know i mean this whole issue has really not been covered uh by uh, particularly the alternative media in any level of um sophistication or, or, or in terms of depth. So, so that's what we're going to focus on over the next few shows. Mm, that's very important. Of course, you know, there's, what, three trillion sitting there in superannuation, big number. You know, if you think about that relative to the property market, it's it's a big number. A lot of people are very much um, uh, exposed to this. And, and they may have some perceptions about the way that they are protected by the way that the regulator works, et cetera, et cetera. But in practice, as we will get into this, um, some of those assumptions are actually quite false and quite misleading. And in fact, there are lots of examples of, frankly, people losing you know, their shirts when they shouldn't be losing their shirts. Indeed, indeed. Now, one of the, one of the, one of the key points about, uh, about this whole topic, Martin, is that um, neither one of us um, you know, um, believe that people shouldn't lose money mm. in, in the sense that in a free market economy, there is risk. Yep. Um, um, things can go up. Things can go down. You can make money, um, and you're able to lose money. But but uh, so so if people lose money because of uh, poor investment choices, well, that's something that they have to cop. But financial crime is 
uh, in, you know, where people lose money due to, uh, you know, people behaving in a way that, that, that is not ethical, not legal, um, you know, if, if people are trying to be deceitful, engaged in fraud, etc. And, and so, 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 that, so, that, so that is where um, uh, I, I think Australia, but also the United States and the UK have, have, have a particular issue. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the things that will come apparent over the next few shows is um, when, you know, the better the fraud, the more real it looks. Um, and and so so uh, and, and you know and a whole host of investments like a whole host of scandals across the world where people have been sucked into something. It looks real. It has a very professional website that 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 they they, they, they they you know give you all indications. It's, it it looks you know something legitimate. And the more real it looks, the more it sucks people in. Um, and then it's only at the point of when the fraud is revealed that is where people realise they've lost. In some cases, their life savings. Yes, and that's really a very important point, John, isn't it? Because people are actually quite clever, and you know, the the really strong forged fraudsters often have got whole constructions behind them in terms of brand and presence and you know everything, right? So it's quite hard sometimes to detect, you know, the fraudulent from the non-fraudulent until the lid comes off, and then everybody realizes just how bad it is. Uh, often, many years down the track. Indeed, indeed. Now, Martin, we're going to play a few shows from 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 from, from a, a whole host of sources because we're really going to just give people a bit of a taste before we get into some of the meat in in, in, in our subsequent shows. But but one of the the big things that has been driving me around this whole topic of financial crime is the consequences that 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 in terms of people face, and particularly for older people who are either close to or in retirement who have lost their life savings, uh, th those type of people um, d just don't have the time to financially recover. Um, and and, and it, when people have significant uh, financial losses due to financial crime or white collar crime, um, what, 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 that, what that means is, is that they, in many cases, ha are gonna be left in, in financial destitution. There's gonna be a whole host of mental and emotional um, scars that are going to drag them down, um, um, and their quality of life into retirement, um, you know, that, that, that will basically collapse. Mm. Um, and so the consequences are horrific. Um, and, and, and because they are horrific, I mean, I mean, I mean that, that, that is why it's important that if we do have, um, uh, you know, financial regulators who are trying to stamp out fraud and financial crime, that they do it as early as possible to minimize the harm to the public. Absolutely. And, uh I guess, again, there's an assumption on behalf of many people who may be investors is that there is actually an active watchdog who is looking after their interests, right? But as we will see later, maybe that watchdog is a bit more asleep than uh, many people think. And of course, some categories like crypto investments are completely outside their ken anyway. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so Martin, what we're going to do now is is that only last month did the, the uh, in terms of the in terms of the BBC, uh, so their Panorama show, they did a, a, a one hour documentary about a, a billion dollar savings scandal, um, and, and I would just want to play the first three minutes of that program because it really illustrates uh, what this one particular scandal has done to investors in in the UK. So this is the house where the guy lives who took my money. This is it. That's what my money pays for. does actually make me very angry. I would have bought a house too, I would have put a deposit on the house. 
Now I'm stuck renting for the rest of my life. He took everything I had. I lost a lifetime's worth of savings. I was so ashamed and so embarrassed. It was sort of eating away at me. I had to look at how I was going to recover mentally and emotionally so I could continue my life. Nobody seems to have been held accountable. A lot of investors have lost money. Where has it gone? Thousands of people put their savings in the hands of a company that offered them a comfortable retirement. This development does not exist. This looks like where the site should have been yeah. built. Yeah. And there's nothing here, there's just a car park. They haven't even started building it yet. This is where your pension money should have been invested. It yeah. should have been invested in this site, on this car park, on this land. Every year, a billion pounds is lost in failed investment schemes. This is the story of one of them. On a very personal level, I went to tell my wife I lost this money. It sent me to a mentally dark place. Now those who lost their precious savings are setting out to discover the truth about the people they trusted with their money. It's very odd that they should make quite a significant payment, over £2 million, to a company based in Gibraltar. I've been doing everything I can to try and get some of this money back. You could just roll over and take it and say, oh, it's gone. But the more investigating we do, the more we're uncovering. To have a Facebook page with your picture alongside the Wolf of Wall Street, not sure what planet this guy's on. They want to know why they're having to fight to get their money back, because others didn't do enough to protect them. The regulators have failed. We want to know why it happened, who is responsible for it. I would fight till my last breath to make sure that we get justice. I'm not going to let them get away with it. No way. Yeah, that's very powerful, isn't it, John? Indeed. Indeed. Um, so, so yeah. So, I mean, what 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 I've just learned from in terms in terms of that clip, Martin, is is that, um, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, you have a veteran who um, uh, who had put a lot of their life savings into a particular investment product uh, that 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 had failed uh, due to due to a uh, white collar crime, um, and uh, and and so basically he's he's basically saying that he can't buy a house and his the rest of his life has been ruined. And then you also have. Uh, in terms of other people who say, I feel embarrassed. Um, I don't want to talk to people about what I've done. Um, and 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 so you know, obviously, I mean that that is one of the issues with uh, people losing their money to financial crime is they don't want to tell their friends and family mm -hmm. or, or professionals that they've made a huge error, and, and that tends to compound people's uh, poor decision with with other poor decisions that they may come on top. Yeah, and I think that's very important. You know, the psychology of it, John, really interests me insofar that some people may actually know that something's not quite right, but they almost don't want to take the lid off and have a look, you know, because it's almost, how could I have been so stupid? But actually, it's very important that, that these things are actually brought out into the open because the chances are if one person's been caught, somebody else somewhere else is being caught even now. So in terms of the broader impact on markets and communities and individuals, you know, it's important to get this stuff out into the open. Indeed. Now, now the other point to say, Martin, is is that so obviously we've alluded the you know alluded to the to the current to the point I'm about to make uh, in the last few minutes is this is not just a unique issue overseas. It is a huge issue here in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we're going to do now, Martin, is is that we're going to play uh, the first couple of minutes of a show f um, that was that was recently aired in the last few weeks by Four Corners. Um, um, and, and the title of the show is called um, The Wolf of Woi Woi. Um, and, and basically we have an individual um, who's from New Zealand who has a criminal history uh, dating back to the 1970s who has been allowed to roam around Australia for the last decade um, and, 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 and ensnare a whole bunch of unsophisticated, vulnerable investors in, in a scheme um, and basically has, has in the process uh, that they, they have ripped these people off. And so um, that, I thought, was a very powerful show um, that, that, that illustrates that you know, financial crime is not an uh, international issue, it's also a very local issue here in Australia. Um, and obviously Woi Woi is only about uh, you know, a couple of hours' drive from where we're sitting at the moment. So how about we play the first couple of minutes from Four Corners as well?
on the New South Wales central coast, a meeting is about to take place at a busy coffee shop between a shareholder and the businessman he invested his money with. Yeah, so you'll change that to, that, that's a, that's what's that, 125,000. You'll change that to, you'll change that to The businessman wearing red doesn't know he's being recorded by the shareholder who's been trying and failing to get his money back. You'll live to regret it, I tell you. You're going to miss out. So the shareholder has decided to film his latest attempt at getting a refund. Why are you, why is this happening? Are you financially embarrassed? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, at the moment it's yeah, financially it's hard. It's just a really stressful time. I'm just literally struggling. The businessman promised life-changing riches for his working-class shareholders. Yesterday I got a check-in for 40 million pounds, for one pound per year. So there's over 100 million in the company, and we're buying more and more money. The smooth talker, known to some as the wolf, pushes for even more money from the stressed tradesman. You've got 180 pounds in the super bank. We're saying take 20 out of that, clear that up. Then give the whole lot back and you can put on the market a, a dollar a share. The wolf has turned the tables. There will be no refund today. Yeah, and of course, some of them may be not that sophisticated, but some of them probably were more sophisticated and still got caught. So, you know, they're not stupid, are they? No, no. The thing is, is that, uh, I mean, you know, whether, whether you're smart or whether you're not so smart, um, I, mean, I mean, human emotions of, of greed uh, and, and, and people sniffing an opportunity, um, that, that can snare a whole host of people. I, I remember the famous story, Martin, is in, in the collapse of the South Sea bubble, um, which, which that wasn't necessarily a uh, fraud scheme per se, but, but Sir Isaac Newton. Nearly, he he actually lost his life savings because he he poured it. Um, he actually got in at, at the end of the bubble, poured his life savings in, the bubble collapsed, and 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 so so you know so uh, so in terms of him, he he uh, had to sort of financially recover after that huge uh, financial event. Mm. The point is, even smart people can get caught out, and these days the sophistication of some of the frauds that are out there are pretty remarkable. So maybe it's not that surprising. Indeed, indeed. So, 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 so yes. Yeah, so, so, Martin, we've covered the financial consequences of white collar crime, financial crime. So, the question then becomes: Is well, how effective are the regulators in trying to uh, not only uh, prosecute fraud or prosecute white collar crime, but also to to find you know to to to, to be able to sniff it out, detect it early? and to put a stop to it before it is too late. Now, one of the big issues that uh, uh, a number of countries have had is that the regulators have been completely asleep at the wheel. Yeah. Um, um, and because they have been asleep at the wheel, the, the public at large have, have been harmed unnecessarily. And so we're going to play a couple of very interesting clips where, where that is, you know, where that has been clearly demonstrated. So the first clip, um, and, and, and obviously we're going to talk about uh, in terms of the first clip is 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 uh, in terms of the United States. So we have um, Harry Mactopoulos, who testified to Congress in 2008, who basically said he went to the SEC, so the Securities and um, um, Exchange Commission, and basically blew the whistle on Bernie Madoff with the 65 billion dollar Ponzi scheme five times, and they ended up doing nothing. So so I think it's worthwhile to just listen to what Harry had to tell Congress. And, and how the SEC failed on that occasion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me here to testify before your committee today regarding my nine-year-long investigation into the Madoff Ponzi scheme. I would also like to recognize my congressman, Stephen Lynch, who is a member of the committee. I look forward to explaining to Congress today and the SEC's Inspector General tomorrow what I saw, when I saw it, and what my dealings with the SEC were that led me to this case being repeatedly ignored over an eight-and-a-half-year period between May 2000 and December 2008. First, I would like to extend my deepest sympathy to the many thousands of victims of this scheme. 
We know that many victims have lost their retirement savings and are too old to start over. We also know that others have lost medical services, community services, and scholarships provided by charities that were wiped out by the Madoff fraud. This pains me greatly, and I will do my best to inform you, the victims, about my repeated and detailed warnings to the SEC. You, above all others, deserve to know the truth about this agency's failings, and I will do my best to explain them to you today. You will hear me talk a great deal about overlawing at the SEC very soon. Let me say, I have nothing against lawyers. In fact, I brought two of my own here today. As today's testimony will reveal, my team and I tried our best to get the SEC to investigate and shut down the Madoff Ponzi scheme with repeated incredible warnings to the SEC that started in May 2000 when the Madoff Ponzi scheme was only a three to seven billion dollar fraud. We knew then that we had provided enough red flags and mathematical proofs to the SEC for them where they should have been able to shut him down right then and there at under seven billion dollars. But unfortunately the SEC staff lacks the financial expertise and is incapable of understanding the complex financial instruments being traded in the 21st century. In October 2001, when Manoff was still in the 12 to 20 billion dollar range, again, we felt confident that we had provided even more evidence to the SEC such that he should have been stopped at well under 20 billion dollars. And again, in November 2005, when Mr. Manoff was at 30 billion dollars, 29 red flags were handed to the SEC, and yet again, they failed to properly investigate and shut down Mr. Madoff's operation. Unfortunately, as they didn't respond to my written submissions in 2000, 2001, 2005, 2007, and 2008, here we are today. A fraud that should have been stopped at under $7 billion in 2000 has now grown to $50 billion. I know that you want to know why there were over $40 billion in additional damages, and I hope to be able to provide some of those answers to you today. And John, the point there is, if they'd acted early, then the size of the losses would have been completely restricted, wouldn't they? Exactly. So the first time that Harry Mctopoulos went to the SEC, uh, the, 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 the Madoff Ponzi scheme was about $7 billion. Um, and by the end of it, because they were asleep for the period of 2000 to 2008, it grew to $65 billion. And, and the losses were just catastrophic for investors right around the world. Mm. Yep. Early action is required, but so often it doesn't happen. Indeed, indeed. Now, now the thing is that, so, so, so now in this recent show by the BBC uh, in, in terms of uh, looking at this uh, billion dollar scandal, there were some critical comments made of the, the their financial regulator called the, um, uh, the, in terms of the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority. And so why don't we actually play a clip from the BBC um, um, and, and obviously find out what the contemporary problems are in the UK. Since people have been allowed to invest their own pensions, there's been a series of scandals in which the Financial Conduct Authority was criticised for failing to protect investors. Steel workers lost thousands of pounds when they were persuaded by financial advisers to transfer out of their secure pension. The Financial Services Regulator, the FCA, is to be investigated over its role in the British Steel pension scandal while 300,000 investors lost around a billion pounds in the Woodford scandal. Neil Woodford's flagship fund is to be shut down. The FCA was again criticised. And it doesn't stop there. Dame Elizabeth Gloucester, formerly one of the country's leading judges, ran an investigation into the collapse of another investment fund, London Capital and Finance. LCF had been carrying on for a number of years the sale of mini bonds. And what LCF did was to sell these bonds quite aggressively to investors. It was discovered that about 11,600 investors had invested in excess of £237 million some of whom were putting their life savings or their pension fund into 
these bombs. I have incredible sympathy for them because a lot of them suffered not only severe financial hardship, but also physical or mental health issues. The FCA failed to spot a number of red flags. Third parties, including apparently financial advisors, were ringing up the FCA's contact center and raising serious questions of serious irregularity and potential or possible fraud. The FCA uh, did not, in my investigation's view, adequately address or deal with these concerns, and it should have done. Had the FCA intervened earlier, the probability is that many less investors would have uh, lost money. Following her report highlighting the regulator's failure, investors were paid compensation. We believe the same thing actually happened in case of Blackmore Bond. And to prove that, we should also get a judge-led inquiry. If the report is very damning, that would be compensation for Blackmore Bond holders. Well, it does sound pretty familiar, doesn't it, John, unfortunately? Yes, yes. I, I mean, I mean, one, one of the interesting aspects of the UK story, Martin, is, is that, and you would appreciate this, you, be, you, you, you being a British subject, mm. is that um, the head of the FCA, the prior head, Andrew Bailey, um, who basically failed, according to the clip we just listened to, rather than being actually held accountable for his actions, was actually promoted to be the governor of the Bank of England. And so he's, he is the current governor. Um, and yet you have people in the BBC saying he catastrophically failed uh, in terms of doing his job. Um, um, and, and, and just like we have issues here in Australia with public officials making bad mistakes, like Philip Lowe at the RBA on interest rates, and last week he was asked the question, uh, are you willing to resign? And he said, I'm not going anywhere. Um, and, and there was a time in Australian and in, uh, and in terms of British history where politicians and ministers and public officials had held themselves to a higher standard. And if they made a catastrophic mistake, they would fall on their sword. But unfortunately, the problem now is, is that when, when, when public officials and politicians do a bad job uh, and the public expects them to move on, they just say, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, as it does seem to be a little bit like, uh, well, we'll stay out, right? And as you say, Mr. Bailey is now in charge of uh, a big inflation problem in the UK. Well, credibility is important, isn't it? Uh, that, that is 100% true. If, if the public do not trust uh, the government, public officials, the courts, etc., then, 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 then the whole fabric of society, the whole fabric of the system comes into question um, and you don't have a cohesive society and, and a high-performing country. So obviously trust is, and, and I remember I did an event, a corporate event um, uh, back in, I think, 2014 um, um, in Canberra and there were some politicians there. It was a closed-door event and one of them talked about Confucius mm. and, and, and how, how in, in, you know, in, in sort of ancient Chinese philosophy, trust is the most central important element of politics because once you lose people's trust it is so hard to be able to get it back and the problem now is, is that we don't have uh politicians and bureaucrats who who think that it's it, it's important for them to maintain the the trust of the public mm. and it's worth underscoring john that over recent years in australia there have been a number of attempts to look at some of those um actions particularly from our regulators right and Frankly, those inquiries got absolutely nowhere in terms of actually making change. We've still got the same issues today. Indeed. Now, now we're going to just play one more clip for our audience, um, and, and it goes back to what the Four Corners story said. Now, here's, here's the more concerning thing for our domestic audience is, so you have this person roaming around the country. Um, uh, he's in the process of, of trying to rip people off. People have lost their life savings. Now, in this particular uh, case study, Martin, there was a whistleblower. He was the chief financial officer of the company. He uh, attempted to go to ASIC, the regulator, 
and basically nothing happened. And so how about we just play that one clip um, about what happened when these investors in the whistleblower went to ASIC? It's a question that demands answers. From the entity responsible for policing all of this, the corporate watchdog, ASIC. Did you report Grey Wolf to ASIC? Yes, I did complaints with ASIC too. Complain to ASIC, yep. Nothing ever happened. We never ever got a reply. We can reveal the complaints to ASIC span more than a decade. Once again, our so-called government watchdog sits on their ass and does nothing. In a written statement to Four Corners, ASIC said it had acted on one complaint about Grey Wolf failing to keep proper financial records. As for the remaining complaints about Grey Wolf and Lithium Gold Mines Australia, ASIC determined no further action would be taken, citing insufficient evidence. I blew the whistle. I raised the alarm, gave all the evidence through the proper channels and not even a phone call, email, nothing. I could have given them whatever they wanted. Not a, not a peep from them. And unfortunately, John, that is not the first time that whistleblowers have got nowhere when they've tried to actually highlight an issue with Attic. I mean, think of the CBA issue some years ago. It, of, of course. So before the Banking Royal Commission, during the Banking Royal Commission, and now even after the Banking Royal Commission, uh, there are, have been a whole host of horror stories of where people have gone to ASIC um, and made various complaints, um, uh, both in terms of investors, but, but also in terms of lawyers, in terms of whistleblowers, and in a lot of cases, um, um, they find that nothing is being done, uh, things are allowed to fester, uh, and then some, and then and then it becomes too late. And then at that point where it's too late, that's when you see catastrophic financial losses in terms of investors, and, and everyone's scratching their heads, thinking, well, uh, why, why why did I have to lose my life savings uh, when ASIC could have done a, a a faster job and a more effective job? And so so that's where. La late last year, there was an inquiry into the, the collapse of the Sterling Income Trust. And from the point, so, so, you know, what came out of that inquiry was that the WA government basically raised concerns about a particular uh, investment product in, in WA largely in March of 2017. And it took ASIC 14 months to commence a formal investigation. Um, um, and, and basically the investors had lost all their money in the process. And, and so, you know, what, what came out, and this is actually came out in the inquiry report, was that um, uh, the, the, the Labor senators on the, on the committee basically said that um, even though the ASIC has multiple responsibilities and a, and a big workload, they should have been able to alert the public and alert these investors a lot sooner. And, 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 and the notion that you get told by the WA government there's something wrong and you sit on it for 14 months, uh, that to Parliament, that was completely uh, um, uh, not acceptable. Yeah, and if there's an issue, and the interesting question we'll look at later on is, how many issues are actually escalated? How many are actually investigated? How many actually translate into uh, real action in the real world? And, and the bottom line is, there's a very, very small percentage that actually ever get open, exposed and dealt with. So you could say that our regulator perhaps is relatively ineffective. Well, well, so, so now, I'm glad you said that, Marta. Now, what I can reveal to the audience was that last Thursday on the 8th of September, I actually went to ASIC. I had a meeting with two of their most senior officials about their performance. Um, so I've been working on something uh, which we'll be talking about in terms of the next episode. So, uh, so today's episode was to give people uh, the context about financial crime um, and in terms of white collar crime and fraud. Um, and so now I can reveal that I have met with ASIC at the most senior of levels um, and uh, we'll be talking in our next show about what we discussed last week. Yep, and so this is now getting into the quest, isn't it? And the package and all of those things that people have been hanging out for. So the good news is, watch the next show. You're going to take, be taken on the next stage of the journey. Absolutely. John, I really appreciate that. This is really such an important conversation. Thousands and thousands of investors should be listening to this. And, you know, ahead, 
you're going to learn some shocking stuff. Absolutely. Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of people, we'll see you next time.